Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 In case you don't know me, I'm Harry Guinness. I organise these events. We're gonna we're gonna use one microphone. I think we'll pass it between us. Otherwise, we're gonna get feedback. Um, I organise these events. For, I'm the Dublin representative for Atheist Ireland, and I'm joined today by Dr. Roger Yates from uh, UCD. So you should probably introduce yourself. You'll most likely do a better job of it than I will. Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, yeah, Roger Yates, UCD. Uh, yeah, I'm I'm here to uh, represent the uh, the vegan contingent of Ireland um, against uh, an avid flesh eater. Or something you said on yeah, it. Yeah. Okay. Um, what what kind of details do you need? Um, just tell us a little bit about. I'm going to project because it's going to be much easier. Can everyone at the back hear me? Yeah. Yes. Will that pick me up okay if I can speak? Yeah. We'd better keep both using the mics. Yeah. Okay. We'll, we'll try both using the mics. I, I don't. I don't mind a bit of feedback. I used to be in a band called Soggy Breakthrough and Feedback. <laughs> um, so the way this is going to work is we're just going to have a discussion about. Our, big, our biggest hit was uh, cosmic oscillation. Cosmic oscillation. Yeah. Right. That's all I'm going to talk about now. <laughs> <laughs> so tell us more about that. Right? Um, so what we're basically going to do is we're just going to have a chat about uh, atheism and veganism and the ethical issues surrounding that. There was a bit of talk on Facebook. Uh, oh, I should probably mention, this is being filmed for the YouTube channel. There will be questions and answers at the end. Um, anyone, is, feel free to ask your question. If you don't want to, sh to show up on YouTube or whatever, mention it to Mick or myself, and we'll organise for that section to be cut, and you won't appear or anything. And can people just chip in any time, or do they have to wait till the end? I'd say wait to the end just for the camera, because we want to get a conversation just for the video. Okay. That answers that. Um, so the way this is going to work is we're just going to have a discussion about the ethical issues surrounding it. Um, as I said, on the Facebook page there was quite a few people wondering um, how this was relevant to atheism. Um, as Michael was saying the other day to me, um, Atheist Ireland actually has in its charter constitution um, a statement saying that essentially it's going to promote ethical atheism. And obviously there's a lot of focus on issues like abortion and uh, euthanasia and things like that, but there is other ethical issues that Atheist Ireland, probably not this year, but potentially could take a stance on in the future. Veganism may or, or may not be one of them. Um, a second factor for that was uh, Vegan Ireland approached me a few months ago about, uh, about organising a speaker. Uh, this struck me as interesting because quite a few of the prominent members of Atheist Ireland are actually vegetarian, not vegan. And there was some discussion over whether vegetarians were more common in uh, atheist groups, or, or vegetarians were more likely to be atheists than a regular person was. Um, I actually thought about that, and <laughs> it was your point there. <laughs> but I actually thought about that. One thing I thought was. Um, the, the thought process to become an atheist, where you have to actively question the status quo of being a Catholic in Ireland or whatever, is actually quite similar to the thought process of becoming a vegetarian or a vegan. You've actually got to think about an issue that most people just don't. You know, if you look at most people who are nominally Catholic, a lot of them just simply haven't thought about the issue of whether or not they believe in God. And likewise, I'd imagine that there is a significant portion of people who just have not given any thought whatsoever to the issue of whether or not they should eat meat. Um, I have given thought to the issue and I've decided I should eat meat. Um, there's quite a few people in the room tonight, and Roger obviously, who've given thought to the issue and decided they should eat absolutely no meat, or you know, not even wear animal products or products from animals. So there is the flip side there, but that's just a little bit of background there as to why I felt this was a relevant speaker, so I hope that will um, quiet the naysayers. Um, so, Roger, um, why are you a vegan? Ooh, uh, the hard ones first, eh? Um, well, I mean, for me, it's an ethical thing. Um, I know there are people who describe themselves as um, environmental vegans and health vegans, uh, but for me, it was always about ethics. Um, and so back in the 1970s, I, you know, learned a few things, and at first it was about the plight of uh, seals and fishes, and um, so I, I went through a, a weird kind of three-month period where I was boycotting the eating of fishes, but not meat. 
and then I realized that that didn't kind of make sense. Normally what people do on their paths, yeah, yeah on, on the path to veganism, the usual pattern is to go vegetarian first, although this, this has been challenged at the moment. Um, so I didn't do that, and I actually never got stuck in, the, in any kind of vegetarian phase, if you like. Yeah, because that's quite interesting, because um, quite a lot of people seem to be only eat fish, rather than eat any sort of meat, and you went the opposite. <coughs> yeah, it was, a, it was a, a, a weird kind of um, way into it, and, and actually it, it came from watching with my young children at the time, John Craven's Newsround, which was a children's news thing, and they were interviewing some seal killers in the Orkneys, and I always remember the statement which said, well, we kill the seals because they're eating our fish. And that kind of, kind of bounced around in my head. Oh. And, and I thought, <coughs> what do you mean, our fish? Oh. Uh, you know. And my first thought about that was, well, surely all it means is that the seals got to the fish first. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then I just thought about it more deeply. At the same time, I was trying to join the Hunts of Atours. And the reason I was attracted to the Hunts of Atours was that they were asking for action and not money. Okay. Yeah, and so that appealed to my kind of activist streak, if you like. Okay, so you got into it um, reasonably late then. It wasn't sort of teenage rebellion. You said that you became it when you had young children. Um, I know it's almost a cliche or sort of thing that the, the, pe the child would rebel in their teenage years against their parents and become a vegetarian, but it's certainly, in my experience, I could well be wrong, that a lot of people do become vegetarian when they're 17, 18, and starting to think about things like that. Well, certainly in terms of colleges, there, there was always a, there was all that kind of cliche. Yeah. That, you know that everybody goes vegetarian when they're at college, and the kind of Nazi just a thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, that that would certainly be the case in the 60s and 70s. I think it's broken down a, oh, a, yeah. a good deal now. Um, in the same sense that you know you would expect those university years or college years to be also the time when you were getting politicised. Yeah. Uh, you you you're getting radicalized by various things, including you know, Melody Trench, and you know, they always say that that's one of the most radicalizing things that, that can happen to you, you know. Um, but those those kind of ideas have kind of you know fizzled out a little bit now, and so um, in general terms, academics in particular would probably claim that society is much more passive now. Okay. And there's kind of been forces of kind of pacification which are quite complex. Um, but, I mean, going back to your first point, really, from a sociological point of view, what you're talking about, in your case and my case, is resisting our socialization. Because you were socialized as a Catholic, and I was socialized yeah. as a speciesist, and we resisted it. And I, as I said in, in, in a talk recently, uh, that's a relatively hard thing to do. And also, you're not doing yourself any favors. So the best thing to do, in, or the easiest thing to do, is to swim with the tide and not against it. Yeah. And so, uh, this is probably why, in effect, uh, we're only just seeing the beginning of, um, I don't know, I mean, maybe that's too, too far to say, back, the beginning of the end of Catholicism in Ireland, but yeah. it's, it's starting to be questioned now. If you go back a generation, yeah, you probably yeah. find that the amount of people questioning it is very small. Oh, well, most of my friends, very few of them would be in any way uh, a devout Catholic or anyway, go to Mass or even think about it. The only they ones... They emotions, but... Not even. They wouldn't even go through the motions. The only ones who would, would be from the country, where it's very much a, you know, a social thing. I had a, a total aside here, I had a friend in, in college uh, from Donegal, and he was asking us a year or two ago what we were doing for Good Friday. And we were like, oh, we're, we're going out to piss. And the look of horror on his face. He was genuinely going home from college to go back to Donegal to go to Mass with his family on Good Friday. Um, so, uh, so you, but, but essentially, most people I interact with uh, on a day-to-day -day basis of my own age would be either atheist or, or not, you know, agnostic, essentially. Yeah. Well, I would, I would say that if you had to look at the demographics of the animal movement, I would think that there would be a large percentage of uh, atheists and agnostics uh, in it, although... Are you an atheist? Or yes, you? yeah. And um, at least I think I am. I'm not, I'm not, I'm, you know, that joke about ag <laughs> it's, um, yeah, there is actually a debate within some parts of the, of the animal movement at the moment about um, yeah, kind of what you might call uh, spiritual based uh, ideas in terms of the, informing their veganism because some people assume that vegans would be uh, atheists on the ground that it's, an, it's a, the idea of looking rationally an, is, yeah. an issue and like you say in your Facebook kind of you know dispensing with the supernatural yeah. You know, and dispensing with those kind of issues, and so, really, from from 
a vegan point of view, an atheist o audience should be wide open for our ideas because in some senses, if you look at it you know, from the point of view of animal rights, or point of view of the environment, or point of view of health, then we've got all the arguments that should make you a vegan. Okay. Well, um, this is not a point of mine. I think it was either Michael or, or Derek uh, who I was talking to earlier in the week about this. And um, they were making the point that's just slipped my mind. <laughs> I think it was you. I had a point there, and it's. Oh yes. Um, essentially, it was that um, religious people have the, this belief that um, animals were given to people to eat, which gives them a very, you know, mm. a very possessive sense about them. Yeah, well, Whereas, God said I could. So. Yeah, yeah. You know, essentially, there's the the God said I could rationalization for a Catholic or, or someone else to do it. I'm not saying that many do it or even think like that, but there's certainly the, the lack of questioning of that because animals are for food and Jesus said so. Well, uh, actually, uh, often that comes out in, in joke form. Yeah. And um, quite often, one of the, the, the you know, if, if somebody sees a, a, a vegan story or even a vegetarian story in the press, you'll often get comments like, well, you know, if, if we, we weren't meant to eat animals, then why did God make them out of meat? Which, you know, which every meter thinks is an hilarious yeah. joke, uh, ignoring the fact that we are also animals and we are also made out of meat as well. Um, but you know that tends to be a, you know kind of tapping into yeah. a religious view on some level, or a religious argument on some level. What what I found over the years that usually the rationalisations of um, either you know Christians or meat eaters tend to be rather shallow, and so when you start scratch it, you usually find there's nothing much there. And quite often you get the, well, God said I could, yeah. argument, which, which you don't have. So no, that, that, that's, uh, that's the point I was making there. Was, uh, <laughs> no, we, we don't have that argument. Yeah. So which <laughs> argument are you going to bring, bring forward? <laughs> <laughs> I'm here for that conversation. What's your, what's your alternative? <laughs> well, personally, I don't see an ethical issue. Ah, okay. That, that's, you know, to be perfectly blunt, I, uh, I don't feel in any way il guilty about eating meat. We did, I don't know if you saw the poll we did on the Facebook page. Yes, yes. Um, yeah, it's interesting that. Yeah, I was no quite surprised. There was, there was quite a few who said that they were they felt guilty, right? Yeah. Um, but the majority said that they didn't feel guilt. No. And so that, you know, from my point of view, as a kind of researcher and, and a uh, sociologist, is quite interesting because um, it's a complicated issue about why they wouldn't. Yeah. And so if you don't, I'd like you to explain why you don't and how you construct the non-guilt eating of somebody else situation. Well, I don't feel that they are somebody else. Yeah. They're something else. Okay. There. Um, from, a, from a psychological point of view, I'm, I'm a psychology student for people who, who, who uh, didn't know that, which is probably most of you. Um, people generally feel a connection to people that are closest to them. You're much more likely to be defensive of your brother than you are of your neighbour. And likewise, you're much more likely to be defensive of people who are in your own country rather than a different country of your own race. You know, white people tend to be associate more with white people and things, and obviously there's biases in there. But people tend to feel closer to things that are more and more similar to them. And as with animals, I don't feel any real connection. Do you, do you, do you think, do you self-identify as an animal? I do, yeah. Okay. Do you self-identify as a mammal? Yes. And an ape? Uh, yes, to a lesser degree. Okay. But so, but I, but I don't consider myself um, up to the point that I'm going to sit in a tree and throw shit. <laughs> uh, no, no, I, I wasn't going to ask that. <laughs> uh, I used to reserve that for later in the evening. But um, no, I mean, in, yeah, but, you know, in terms of your saying, well, you know, you, you feel a disconnect. Yes. And now you just you just explained that you don't. So well, you, I, I do. I, I feel that while I am a member of that, I. I'm so it's kind of concentric circles with you. So it's kind of yes. yourself, your family, my, yeah. your community, your nation. Yeah. Yeah. See, I mean, from my point of view, I, I think that if people took, I mean, like in sociology now, the big deal is is globalization. If people took seriously the idea that we are living in a global village, then that would be much better for the human being living on the planet. If we actually thought that everybody else was fellow villages, as it were. Yeah. Because that would mean then that you wouldn't have 30,000 children dying of starvation related oh, issues good. you know, every single day, yeah. uh, including on 9-11, which is the kind of controversial point to, to make about that. But, but the point is 
every single day we allow that. Yes. Okay. So when people say, well, let me ask you a question then and see if I can develop the point. Do you think human beings are more important than, than other animals? Yes. Okay. So let's imagine two population explosions. You've got however many billion humans now, we're in between six and seven. Okay. But we've also got billions of non-human animals which we breed. It's not as though we capture them, right? No. Okay. Now, of those two populations, if the human beings were deficient in terms of food security, you would prior prioritize those, right? You yes. would give the food to the... Yeah, but that's not what we do. What we do is we give feed to the animals rather than food to the people. That's not strictly relevant because the animals tend to be bred in countries where there isn't that I'd imagine. Certainly the beef industry in America isn't really giving food to cows that would be given to children in Africa. No, but, that, but that's the point. I mean, the, 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 point, the point is, in terms of the, the kind of gross amount of, of foods that are produced, we could feed everyone. We could feed every, every Gross food, food is yeah. kind of a but, different but, issue. It's the same as well, the typical Irish mammy of eat your dinner, there's a starving child in Africa. I don't, I don't, I'm not quite sure if that particular anecdote well, fits with what I'm saying, but um, what, what, I'm, what I'm really saying is that e even if you've got a situation where you've got areas set aside for feed, yeah. now often, and it's also relevant with cash crops as well, but often what you've got is the best land going to service the needs of other animals through which you get your hamburgers. So if we were to radically alter that situation and take seriously the idea of human rights and the fact that humans really are allegedly more important, yeah. like everybody claims, then the first thing we would do is feed everybody. And we don't. We prefer to feed ourselves with hamburgers, which take a lot of feed, rather than giving food to the starving. My account to that is I don't, you know, you're obviously much more knowledgeable, knowledgeable on the issue than me, but I don't think there is that equivalency of food. And, you know, a bushel of wheat in America is not the same as a bushel of wheat in Africa. You can't transport it as easily. There's international barriers to that, but there's also just time barriers, the cost of moving well, things like that. We, 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 can, we can transport soldiers all over the world. I'm sure we can <laughs> yeah. transport you know, food all over the world. Uh, you know, so I'm, I'm not convinced about that. It's, it's a question of political will, and it's also a question of, of moral will, in a sense. So in, in some senses, we give lip service to the idea of human rights, yeah. I believe, and... Um, if you really were, were very serious about that, I think we would organise society a lot differently. I mean, we'd think very critically about the capitalist mode of production, you know, winners and losers and all that kind of stuff, but we certainly would, as a first priority, you know, if, if the value system that you seem to have was prevalent throughout the world, you would then think, well, how come it, how come it, it isn't it the case that everyone is fed? It just doesn't seem to make sense. Well, because, as I was saying at the point, people feel more connection to people closer to themselves, and that starving children in Africa, most people ignore it on a daily basis because it's a world away. And those same people, those same people who asked them would say that they would adhere to the principle oh, of human okay. rights. Of course. Okay. There so, is that disconnect yeah. there that people, you know, that human rights is a huge issue, and that people often just don't care that much. Okay, so you're, you're essentially saying that you've got these concentric circles, yes. and that almost, if you like, um, creates some kind of nationalism or cr creates some kind of, you know, uh, community feeling for people, you know, close the, to the closer, yeah. yeah. And then you've got your nation and then maybe some international relations. Yeah. And that's why you feel that other animals are even further away because well, substantially people, I people care, care about care, humans as well. I care far more about children in Africa than I do about other animals. But, and it's, you know, it's, it's almost bad to say, but... I'm not doing anything about starving children in Africa. I, I'm sitting here having a discussion with Roger. I'm, you know, going to go home. I'm going to sleep fine as people die all over the world. And if I, if there was a moral issue that I wanted to crusade, then I'd fly to Africa and help well, them. Well, one of the first things you could do to help them is to be vegan. I don't see, don't really see how that would help. Um, you know, an, another issue, of course, is the fact that uh, you know pollution doesn't. Uh, respect national boundaries, and uh, the environmental impact of meat eating is great. And so now we've got an issue that... Um, Do you differentiate between beef and chicken in terms of the meat industry? I, differ I differentiate between um, beef and chicken in, 
in several ways, in the, in the sense that if you talk about the conversion rate in this argument, then the conversion rate from your argument is better in terms of chicken. Oh, it is. I, I yeah, yeah, I'd mainly yeah, chicken yeah. more, more so than beef. Yeah, I accept right. that beef have, does have issues with it yeah. and things. It's interesting. You see, the language is interesting. You, I say chickens, you say chicken. Oh, I yeah. eat chicken. I, yeah. I don't know. That's right. The food is chicken yeah. rather than... Well, you eat chickens. So, you know, it's, it's, it's quite interesting because if you look at a ideology that separates, then it's linguistic in character. You know, so, you know, speech of this will often... I mean, you, you already described other animals of things. So, if you were des describing the behaviour of a dog, you might be saying it, or a cow, it, right? Rather than she or he. Well, if I couldn't identify the gender, if I could identify the gender, I probably would use he or she. Yeah, okay. So, you know, often part of the prejudice, but also the ideological social construct, is built into the language as well, which some people are trying to kind of... Uh, you know, you know in, the, in the same way as feminists try to challenge yeah. You know, patriarchal language, yeah. and um, you know the famous case there would be kind of you know history became his story and that kind of stuff. Yeah. So there are people, and John Denayer in particular, uh, an armor theorist, trying to challenge linguistically what we do to the animals, yeah. which is to lessen their moral status by calling them it, uh, and that you know it pushes them away and creates that very social distance that you're claiming you rely on in order to eat them. So what what we are what we are Suggesting is that if you thought more about the issue and about the way that it's been constructed, and you've already said that there are aspects of your life which you would resist your socialization, oh, yeah. well, we, we, what we're as vegans asking is for society to be reflexive, which is what atheists ask yeah. society to do, but on this issue as well as yours. And I have, I have actually considered the issue of vegetarianism rather than veganism. And I decided I don't care enough about not eating meat. I eat meat uh, most meals. Um, some of you may notice I'm a little bigger than Roger. Um, I try, <laughs> I try, I'll arm wrestle if you want. <laughs> I train about eight times a day. Not eight times a day, eight times a week. Uh, in between weight training and other training and things like that. So I'm on a very high protein diet. I'd be eating about 100 grams of protein every day, which is two chicken breasts at two meals as well as getting it, you know, from other, from grains and things like that, but you also get it. Um, and so one, one point I actually wanted to discuss with you is um, how could someone like that, or like me who trains as much as me, it becomes very, very difficult to maintain a vegetarian diet. Now there is marathon runners and things like that who have done it. Now there's, there's, lots, there's lots of vegan weightlifters and, and bodybuilders now, and in fact, you know, some of the best, you know, there's a lot of myths about, you know, you get this, that, and the other from animal sources when you have to check it out. The, 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 more, the, the better sources of all of those things tend to be plant-based. And so... For example? Um, well, just in, in terms of just about any, anything you like. I mean, obviously, in terms of veganism, there are issues of, uh, about certain things, like vitamin B12 and, and the, yeah. those kind of issues, right? Mm -hmm. But... Okay, like that? Okay. So, you know, those are issues. But in terms of the fundamental nutritional requirements, then the, the vegan diet is adequate and throughout all, all the ages uh, of life. And, um, you know, we've got you know, dietetic associations all around the world stating that. So, um, veganism is not a, a problem nutritionally, it's a problem socially. Uh, and we're going back to your point, there are, uh, as you said, there are lots of... Um, are the, are the, you know, the kind of endurance kind of sports yeah, people they who are ve vegans, yeah, you know, yeah. running up and down mountains and all that, they tend to be a lot of vegans, you know, the triathlons, that kind of thing. But there are quite a lot now of vegan bodybuilders and it's quite easy to Google it. And oh, you, right. you'll find them. I mean, one, one guy, I think he's called Robert Creek, um, who's, um, you know, a big name within it. But, I mean, the, the vegan bodybuilders now are winning prizes and stuff, so it's not right. like, yeah. Uh, no, because it is very, very difficult to get uh, the sort of the ease of access. You certainly have to consider what you're eating far more, uh, I'd imagine, to get the, the requirement of the protein. Well, well yeah, I mean, but on, the on a general level, you could make that case, you know, I mean, I, I read labels, you might not. Yeah. No, not really. <laughs> but, um, you know, I, d I, tend, I tend not to see that as a terrible kind of burden to, 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 to you know, because, you see, the thing is, at the, end of, at the end of my day, you know, I, I don't feel the sense of 
deprivation about being a vegan, which often from the outside might seem to be the case. Oh, you know, they're giving up this, and they're, you know, they're against that, and that, you know. But you know, there's a lot that vegans get, and there's a lot that we're for, like you know, peace and justice and this kind of stuff. But also, what we do get is a sense of well-being at the end of the day, because we know that we haven't deliberately exploited anyone. Okay. I, I, I still find it very interesting that you refer to animals as any one bird, because that's something well, that usually would be reserved if, for. Well, if you, if you, if you look at um, legal categories, there, there are two legal categories, and other animals actually are in an interesting position, because you've got persons and things. Now, that's the legal construct. Now, sometimes the corporations are placed into the person's side of it. So it's it's not as a you know so we're not equating persons with people, okay. So you could have a legal person who is not human. Yes, so yeah. yeah, so you you could have that. It's it, it, you know, it's feasible. I think and it was so, Mitt Romney who recently said something along the effect of corporations are people too. <laughs> well, I'm not going to say. No, no, but it's just just yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah so you know, in, in, so in in those in those terms, you know. And there's a great animal rights philosopher called Tom Reagan, and he says that other animals are some bodies and not some things. In other words, he says that they're subjects of a life. What that means is that they've got a, a psychological life, they've got a physical life which matters to them. What happens to them matters to them, because they're aware. Now, there are lots of arguments about self-awareness at the moment, but it's quite interesting that there's a new academic discipline called cognitive ethology, which is showing, because in recent years we've started to research other animals, yeah. not as exploiters of them. We know a lot about how to exploit them and how to use them. We're now starting to look at them in terms of their abilities and capacities, and we're finding things which are astounding us, like uh, proto-morality. You know, there's case after case now where other animals have saved other animals, and not, and not ironically, going back to your first point really, not even of their own species. So you've got a, lo a lot of other animals who will rescue you know, animals of other species. And, and so this discipline is, is teaching us that there's a lot more going on in non-humans yeah. th than we previously thought, or from an exploiter's point of view, if you like, to use that language, uh, more than we want to think. Because obviously the first thing that someone does who wants to exploit another is to reduce them in status. Okay? When you start to learn about their capacities, then you get a situation where you might have to reconsider. You touched that, on something in there. Uh, you mentioned awareness and self-awareness and things. Yeah. And just before we move on too far past that, is awareness the key issue for you uh, in, in terms of eating meat? Is it that they are aware? On your own? Uh, yeah, well... I mean, that, that goes back to something that's been bouncing around Facebook today, which is a Jeremy Bentham quote, which is, it, you know, it doesn't matter if they can't speak or, or they can't reason, it's can they suffer, okay? And so that, that fed into, some, somebody mentioned on, on Facebook that probably Peter Singer would be, would be mentioned today, and, it, and it's, it's likely, but Peter Singer is not an animal rights advocate, <coughs> he's a utilitarian philosopher. And so, but he picked up on the Bentham thing about sentiency effectively that they can suffer and also they can feel pain and also the law reflects that so animal welfare law says that you can't do things to them which which are very negative you can't you can't do things like terrorize them yes. so it recognizes the fact that other animals can be in a state of terror you know so animal welfare law is quite interesting in that sense it's it's kind of on that level it's quite advanced yeah you know. then you've got new or newer ideas from Reagan in the, in the shape of uh, Denea I mentioned and Gary Francione and a few other philosophers who have gone back to Singer's idea of sentiency but uh, constructed a rights-based argument on that. So yeah, so this awareness thing is, is crucial because if, you, if you're not aware then you don't have an interest like plants and so consequently uh, what, we, what we would argue is that sentiency is the key. And there is another philosopher called Richard Ryder, and he says that we can make sense, everybody in this room should be able to make sense of a moral category called the sentient. In other words, there's something about being sentient that's important. And if you look in terms of human rights, 
then you would immediately start thinking about the right not to be tortured, a, ne a negative right. Well, that applies to other animals as well. This is why we're trying to get other animals, we're trying to kind of punch holes, if you like, in the species barrier, which you're relying on, in, in a sense, although, I mean, it's interesting, your, your argument is quite interesting, because you're also saying you don't really care about other humans that, that much either, so it's just kind of... <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm gonna, I, I will make the point that um, if it came to a situation where I, you know, in order to survive, I would have to eat human meat. I probably would if it was a plane crash or, or similar. Yeah, well, I doubt I'd kill someone to do it. I think that would be a line too far. But certainly, um, what's the film where it happened? In Argentinian. Argentinian. Yeah, the Argentinian. Certainly, where they apparently alive. Yeah, apparently tastes like chicken. Um, I would. Well, we are made of meat. Aren't we? we are made of yeah, meat. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. But everything tastes like chicken. Can they not be more imaginative with that? I would have thought we'd be closer to pork than chicken. Would you? Well, you might be. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're probably just like a chicken drumstick or something. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm a bit stringy at this point. Yeah. Actually, there, 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 is, there is a film on uh, YouTube uh, which is aliens sat in a cafe. And, you know, one, one of them is kind of reporting to the other, like a more, more community type situation. And he said, you know, what's the score? And he said, well, they're made out of meat. And he goes, what do you mean, they're made out of meat? And, you know, these humans, they're made out of meat. You know, that, that's essentially uh, what, what, what we are. Uh, I don't. I don't think he, he tasted them. You know, yeah. you know in terms of that. But yeah, it's, I mean, it, it is a cliche that we do supposed to um, taste of, of, of uh, chickens. Everything tastes of chickens. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so the processing. Yeah. So we're discussing about uh, the awareness yes. of the issue. Um, so I, I did a bit of uh, research for this, obviously. But a thing that had come up before. Be good, uh, uh, not much. Not that much. <laughs> I'm very busy recently. Uh, I saw it a while back, and I found the article again today. It was on the Huff in the Huffington Post, and it was an art, art architecture student in the UK. I'm sure you came across it, um, who, for an arts project, essentially in order to challenge assumptions and things like that, he created a design whereby you would sever a chicken's frontal cortex, um, essentially at birth, and then plug it into a matrix-like machine, uh, you know, where it's fed. And there's enough of the brainstem left that it's kept alive. It's able to have its bodily functions, it's able to grow, it's able to do that. But anything that makes it a chicken or aware that it was a chicken or anything like that is totally severed. It's, it's literally brain dead. And then, rather than growing battery chickens, where they do indeed suffer mm -hmm. and things like that, by severing it at birth when they are essentially too young. Yeah. To well, I, actually. Okay. The, um, th there have been people working on that kind of yeah, thing, and of often the tabloid press will call it Frankenstein food. Yeah, stuff, right. Right? Uh, but people have been working on that for a long time. I remember from the 80s, they used to be in Cambridge, there was a laboratory called Babraham. And uh, they, they, were, they were doing uh, experiments to kind of create a legless, featherless uh, chicken, which effectively was like almost like a square block of meat, yeah. meat really. Uh, so there's been, a, there's been a lot of that. And uh, of course now, the the kind of modern version of that is these moves to bring about um, you, you know the petri dish meat, yeah, yeah the laboratory meat, awesome. yeah. And so there, there was a very interesting discussion about that from um, from somebody within the animal movement who was for it, and somebody in the animal movement who was against this idea uh, on a on a blog, and it's called the Vegan Option. It's really well worth uh, listening to because. At the moment, because it's an ex ex experimental stage, then they are using things like stem cells. Yeah. There, there is a suggestion that we'll get to a stage where you can create meat, yeah. which has got no animal um, component, even kind of historically. Uh, and also, it's interesting. I mean, I, I, I wouldn't. I personally would eat laboratory meat if it was from uh, a human dog. I, w I wouldn't see a problem with that. Okay. You know, I mean, ironically, a religious person might. Yeah. But you know, we probably wouldn't. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. it, so it, it it is the ability to suffer the, uh, the awareness and the fact that for me, other animals are someone else. And mm -hmm. just as somebody said recently, when you're dealing with eating meat or using other animals, someone else is involved. And that's what makes it a moral issue for me. Okay. So you'd have less issue with the, the chickens with their, their frontal cortex cut off then? 
Well, obviously, that, that in itself is an experiment, so that in the yeah. section argument. So, yes, I, I would, but in, in terms of the resulting being, yeah. as a non suffering person, you know, it, uh, the, the, you know some, some people have been talk, talking within our movement about whether it would be morally acceptable, for example, to eat roadkill. Yeah. Yeah. Um, on, the, on the grounds that, you know, no, no one deliberately killed this being. You know, I, th I think it's some sex of Buddhism that uh, it's forbidden to slaughter meat, but eating meat itself isn't. Mm -hmm. So they would drive animals off cliffs because then God <laughs> killed them, not them. Oh, I think, I think, so, so yeah, yeah. I, th I think you might have to look at intent. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the broken argument. Oh, look at cats. <laughs> Dinner. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, right. <laughs> but, yeah, I'm not quite sure where I can go with that. But, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but what, what was the the opinion then? What was the sort of um, the stance on that? Well, it, it, it gets around some of the ethical issues, yeah. but it doesn't resolve the social movement issue. Yeah. And so, if you look at the definition of veganism, it's that vegans don't use and consume animal products. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and other definitions are. That, that vegans don't want to exploit or be cruel or cause suffering and that kind of yeah. stuff now. So it, it deals with that element of it yeah. in, in the same way as it would if you were to suddenly go around the corner and you think, ah, dead human body, hamburger, which you yeah. might. Right? And so... Um, it's nice to see you already have such a low opinion. Yeah. <laughs> it normally <laughs> takes a few weeks of knowing me to get to that stage. I'm just, I'm just feeding off your argument now. And, uh, <laughs> Uh, yeah, Hopefully so, not feeding off me just no, yet. No. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was warned about you. Uh, warned about yeah, you? Yeah, not, not, not enough. But, uh, Who's warning you? Who <laughs> <laughs> don't have to have words I, with that? I was told that you had a wicked sense of humor. Right? <laughs> obviously true. So what, what were we saying? It must have been something serious, obviously. Right? <laughs> Clearly. Uh, just to do with the awareness issue and, and the... Uh, yeah, so... It, yeah, to, yeah, to go back to that, in terms of the social movement, obviously, if you like, uh, something that was rather mocked actually, but if you like, the spirit of veganism yeah. is, is not moving towards trying to work out in what circumstances vegans can eat meat. Uh, the spirit of veganism is to create a society which wouldn't want to go there. Yeah. Okay. But in terms of the, that other ethical issue about suffering and everything, that would be resolved by that. And the same... Or, or less so, I think, would be your, your chicken example, yeah. because obviously you've got a very invasive uh, situation at the beginning, which we, we would probably class as an example of a section. Yeah. Well, I'd personally um, <laughs> prefer chicken like that than I would battery chicken or whatever, simply because uh, I'm not utterly heartless. I do think that uh, the meat I eat should suffer as little as possible. Mm. Now, there is obviously a, a very hard uh, surface on that limit, since I'm killing them or having them killed and then eating them. <laughs> So there's only, there's only a, a slight limit to what the suffering can be defined as, but I certainly would rather they weren't tortured while they were alive. And... What, what, what about other types of uses? There's been an interesting discussion uh, online recently in a petition at the moment, because uh, there's a new film, a new documentary, and I think it's called Donkey Love, and it's about Colombian men who have sex with donkeys. So this, this, takes, it into, this takes it into issues like bestiality, as it's traditionally called, um, you know, or the um, you know, sexual exploitation of the animals, this kind of stuff. Um, but it's quite interesting because even from an animal welfare point of view, that's quite a difficult subject because a lot of people react to it because it's a taboo. Yeah. But it's quite interesting because people who are quite happy to stick knives and forks into the animals when they're dead yeah. and, and are happy for that kind of activity to go on. So if there was no suffering, from your point of view, anything would go, wouldn't it? In terms of what, in terms well, of you're saying, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, personally, I'm not sexually attracted to animals. Um, no, no, but if, if um, I'm, 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 I'm not trying to lead you into a dark alley. Right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I hope not. Yeah. When you mentioned the film was called Donkey Love, I yeah, genuinely yeah. thought that was not going to be like. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, but, but, you know, what what I'm trying to get at is if if you are consistent with your criteria, and that. You know, oh, what's going on there? One, two, yeah, this one's still working. Um. Maybe, maybe try them one at a time. When one of you is speaking, turn the other one, turn the other. Oh, okay. This could get interesting. <laughs>
a little bit large now. Um, what was I saying? Yeah, no, it's a, it's a question. I'm just kind of exploring your... See, the thing is, we first started talking about how, how the fact that, you know, you, in a sense, resisted your socialisation, and I resisted my socialisation. In terms of how we are brought up in a species society, there, the, the ideology of animal welfare is built into that. Yeah. And, and essentially, what most users of other animals say is what you just said a few minutes ago, which is that, you know, I'll use them, I'll eat them, I'll consume them, I'll use them for other purposes, but I don't want them to see them tortured, and in fact, if they had a, if they had a fine life, that would be great. So that's the kind of animal welfare side of this issue. Yeah. Okay, so I think it's just your mic that the that the issue is with. <coughs> well, this gives me a massive advantage for the uh, <laughs> closing few minutes. Of this. Yes, Roger, I totally agree. You should eat meat. <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> I rigged that. <laughs> yeah, so back to your bestiality point, um, <laughs> which I didn't think was coming up, so I, I didn't study it. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, to me, um, the issue isn't so much the the, um, the abuse of the animals there, it's what's going on in the, in the person's head who would do that. Um, in the same way that some people are attracted to animals, some people are attracted to children. And it's undeniable that there is something non-normal in their, in their psychology. Psychology? Psychology. <laughs> I, I should know how to pronounce that, obviously, you know, studying it. Um, <laughs> In, in their psychology that's uh, letting them do that. So I don't think there's really an animal welfare argument there because for someone to be sexually attracted to a donkey is... Um, yes, <laughs> odd, uh, odd. <laughs> Um, in, in, term, in terms of their argument, this, this is a cultural phenomenon which is entirely rational in the sense that, well, first of all, there's a medical belief that it makes the male penis bigger but also it's a very catholic country and so that means that you've got a lot of frustrated guys uh, and the, the idea is so the medical profession would actually recommend that men do this okay. and in, in the sense it would be that one of the rationales would be that it would cut down the amount of uh, sexualized abuse of women. Yeah? And so, from their own internal logic, there, there is a rationale which kind of makes sense internally. Now, the, the reason that I brought it up is because, for us, it's an issue of animal use. And for us, it, that would be one form of animal use, which is obviously not socially sanctioned. Yeah. Whereas, what we're dealing with when we walk out on the street is there is lots of forms of animal use which are. So for a vegan walking around in society can be quite a painful situation in the sense <coughs> that you see the leather, you see the fur, you see the, the wool, and you see the McDonald's and everything else. Okay. And, and these are just, to us, forms of animal use. Yeah. So I was just trying to tease out you know, how you would construct a barrier between those forms of use you know, if you know, if it met the criteria of animal welfare, that's what I was trying to get at. Yeah. Well, yeah, as I said, it's not so much an issue of animal suffering for me, it's more of a, what the hell is that person doing? <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's to the, I'd be much more interested in... But, but in theory, then, in theory, if you were brought up in that kind of society, then, and you were socialising to that kind of society, you'd probably be okay about it, so long as the welfare... Yeah. Uh, Stephen's just waving his hand back there. Yeah, when, in terms of uh, using an animal... <laughs> Okay, well, I think we've been at this for 45 minutes, so I think, um, yeah, I think we'll weave some questions in with this. Uh, this.